Festa spent her entire life, much of it under the stresses of apartheid, educating women and children and young adults who were being persecuted by their government. Her many publications focus on gender equality and the promotion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual rights. She has now also joined the pre-colonial catalytic historiography um, project at uh, CAS with a focus on land and women. Um, um, go to CAS. Center for African Studies. Um, as a member of the African National Congress, Fester was charged for treason in 1988 and went to prison for two years where she spent five months in solitary confinement. It was during this time of incarceration that she wrote a one-woman play, Apartheid's Greatest Closet, The Spirit Cannot Be Caged. That she wrote, yeah, um, this play was composed and recorded inside Festa's head because under solitary confinement she was not allowed to have writing materials. The play was later performed in countries around the world, including Cuba, Nicaragua, and China. After serving a term in Parliament, Festa was appointed as a commissioner on gender equality. Her most recent post was as professor of, in sociology at Solplaik University. Prior to this, she was professor and deputy director for the Center of Gender, Culture, and Development in Kigali Institute of Education in Rwanda. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Gertrude Fester. And let me acknowledge all the dignitaries sitting in front of me. Thank you for coming. And uh, I trust that we will have a, an evening of, of um, good interaction but more importantly, uh, uh, an evening of learning. Um, uh, Rudy is a brave man to, to, to write and go public on a book on reconciliation. And so, um, and we need to celebrate that. And tonight is all about this book and what it's trying to, 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 to say to us. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Rampella, if you would do us the honors and start the conversation with Rudy. Um, I will sit right in front of you, Doctor. I will try and catch your eye um, I think when you go I need to, to just hold it. I need to push my chair so I can. Right. Okay? Yeah. Now I can see you. <laughs> well, not my eye. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Morwen. It's wonderful to be here, and it's particularly wonderful to be here to celebrate Rudy's bravery. I believe that we need more of this kind of storytelling about who we are and what we are wrestling with. Bruch Bowers is a real courageous narrative about us. And I'm pleased it is written in Afrikaans because Afrikaans is a language that is spoken by a lot more people than we acknowledge. And if we want to talk about matters of the spirit, we need to reach people through the medium that is closest connected to their spirits. I used to be a good African student, but that was way back when. And you know, with language, if you don't use it, you lose it. But I battled through reading this book because I wanted to hear the voice of the story in its original language <clears throat> medium. So I'm going to start the conversation with Rudy with one simple question. What made you want to break the conspiracy of silence about who we are? Mm. <laughs> 
could I start with something else? <laughs> no. No, thank you. Um, and just thank you for everyone to, to attend. And um, doctors, thank you for your um, willingness to, you know, uh, be part of this conversation. Um, that was most likely the biggest lesson uh, when I was part of this story was that silence allowed all of it to happen. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it, it, it got to get out. <laughs> it's just almost as simple as that. Because, um, this, you know, so in the, the book tells the story of four students, two black students, two white students, their life stories, their biographies on race, essentially. And one of the key themes in sort of sustaining you know, their own struggles with ignorance was the fact that the world around them went quiet around the fundamental difficulties of the past and race. So that was the one reason is that it, it was right and good and just to break the silence. The second thing was that um, I needed to sort of confront silences in my own life. And what better way to confront them than to speak about them? The reason why I start with the difficult question is that this conspiracy of silence is not unique to South Africa. Society is in transition, as we are. Often don't want to talk about where we come from and how where we come from has made us into who we are and how who we are with where we come from, are planning or preparing ourselves to walk in a very deliberate way to a destination of our dreams. And so what is particularly important about this book is that it is set at a university. Now you would have thought, that's where thinking people, people who are analytic, people who, who have the, the knowledge, the capacity to tell stories and to analyze those stories, would have been quite at the forefront of breaking the silence. And yet, they were not. So, Rudy, what is it about the University of the Free States in this case, and you could say the same thing about the University of Cape Town, uh, Stellenbosch, Takis, what is it about the universities that we are not able to be the leaders of society in matters of who we are and where we come from. <laughs> so, um, well, what I, uh, um, so my attempt was to make sense of how this rights incident came about. Because you may, well, you may not know, you may not remember, but at the time, Free State University had been considered a case study in successful racial integration. Right in just at the start of at the turn of the century, um, Madiba had accepted an honorary degree from Free State because Free State uh, Free State had been known as a former white institution that was succeeding with this process, and so when raids happened, it just exposed this whole thing. Say, but you know what's going on, you know, below the surface. So what in actual fact happened, and much of the first chapter is about that, and what had taken place is that part of the solution for racial conflict, if you will, threatening racial war, um, at that particular institution was to create two worlds, to allow racial, racially based residences to develop, not to policy-wise approve it, but to allow people to go and stay whoever, whoever they want to stay with on campus, rather than push integrated placements, for instance. There was an allowance for Afrikaans and English classes, so that black students attended black class, uh, uh, English classes, and, you know, generally, 
and white students would, would attend Afrikaans classes. The white students would attend the Dutch Reformed Student Church right next to campus, and black students would travel into town to attend churches. When you want to go to the social club in town, you would, you know, the whiteies would go to these clubs, and you know, and the black students would go to that. So what had happened is, you know, through a number of one would, you know, m could maybe argue good intentions, there had been two worlds on one campus, and therefore essentially there had been apartheid on campus. Um, and and so what else would happen than something like rates? But the fact was that the main narrative and the successes of what had been achieved by leadership through students and, and university leaders on campus was perceived as a success story. And of course it was 10 years before, but it stopped there. And, and to my mind, that, that had sort of illustrated to a large extent how often the emphasis on the reconciliation as black and white talking to one another and having peace. Um, is problematic. Now, of course, we don't have those definitions ne necessarily formally and sort of theoretically even, and even sort of, but in reality, how we talk about reconciliation in the street, when we're at home and with people and so forth, we think it's peace. But what was shown at rights, reconciliation did not give peace. It repeated the unfortunate and troublesome, the horrific histories that we live with. Anyway, so if, if, if one could draw from that, you might argue and say that what the must fall movements had done is to again create a bit of a crack in that perception that how we drive change is a calm, collected process where we you know, progress from one step to the next and we achieve the one goal and the next, which and of course it isn't, is what is shown here. But that would be sort of, a, sort of an, an early sort of reading um, from what happened at Free State was that there had been two worlds and we kept our eyes closed to it because we were looking for success. That's a good point at which to introduce the title of the book, Brug Boers. So you have two worlds, and you, Rudy, base decides that what needs to happen is to connect these two worlds somehow. Can you? share with the audience why you chose the title and how that uh, reflects the kind of work that you were doing uh, and some of the very exciting things you you've created new terms like in-betweenness uh, and uh, etc right um Okay, so um, so much of my own studies is in theology. I'm a I'm a predicant um, in the Dutch Reformed Church, uh, who's had a court who's had a court case today, seeking justice. But okay, um, or, or love at least. But all right. So um, sorry for that. Yeah, um, where was I now? <laughs> so, Frieda Marcus. So in the, in, in the Christian tradition um, around reconciliation, freedom market is a key concept. Peace builders, building peace. So if we see in the example of the free state, if, if at least only there, but elsewhere as well, that peace building did not change, or did not bring the change we longed for and hoped for, then peace building might not be the end that we're looking for, the end in itself. Something f should follow that. And so hence, um, you know, building bridges, more so than peace. And that's, that's my point around how we've come to sort of work with the notion of reconciliation. That it is about peace and peacefulness, even though we say it must lead to change. Reconciliation must bring restitution and all these things. We talk the talk, but in the end, the over, overarching frame remains, it, it must bring peace and peacefulness. But how does change bring peace? It creates insecurities, it creates conflict, it, it causes new relationships and new definitions, and that in itself is not, it's not peaceful. So we want peace in the context of war and so forth and, 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 and societal conflicts, but you, you know, so, 
So then when you talk peace building, it does not give us the change we want, and hence bridge building. So what I had seen happening around me at Free State as I, as I you know, made an attempt to join the, the struggle there, was that there had been student leaders, black and white, who had been struggling not for peace, but for change through peace. And so what was interesting is to see that they were not defining themselves as peace builders in a context of the rights, which you could label as a context of racial war. That's how angry people were on the campus, in the country as well, but people were really ready to grab each other by the throat. So, but they did not want to be peace builders. They wanted to do more. And so the notion of, 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 of bridge building as, as I've come to discover in their lives, and which I think is true to a large extent, is that it is on the one hand, as I always say, the one leg that you work, work, walk with as a bridge builder is to bring people together to reconcile. Yeah, of course, you know, which leads to a moment of peace. We must find each other, hear our stories, uh, discover each other, recognize each other as fellow human beings, see each other. But then the second leg is what do you do with that togetherness? Peace? No, no. With the togetherness you must construct something new, reimagine, move on, and not move on in the sense of leaving the past behind, but move on in the sense of designing new, trying it out and continuing with it. So um, bridge building, as, as, as I try and explore the idea in the book, has to do with, with the combination of recon reconciliation and transformation. Or in the Afrikaans, versoening en omforming, to change everything completely. So um, that's in a sense how we talked about it. And, and, and the, for me, the, one of the most exciting and uh, uh, hopeful discoveries um, in exploring the lives of these four young people um, who were doing this change when they were 21, 22 years old, uh, which is amazing, um, is um, that they held their own heritage, their identities as gained through their home communities, their families, you know, as Afrikaans or Sutu or Venda and so. They did not reject that, they held it, they valued it. But that did not become a limitation for them in building another identity which had them connect with people around them who are very different from them in those very same categories in the history of our country. So what you found, and this was the exciting thing, that they had, they were more than the limitations of the stereotypes of gender and race and all these things, and that more actually matured in their lives over time from a young age. That's why I wrote up the whole biography. From a young age, they actually tried in between things to be both black, do some black things and do some white things, and do some woman things and do some men things, I'm, you know. As, and so they, they actually f struggled with understanding that as children of transition, that they're in between this, these binaries. And that in between us wasn't something that happened in a moment and then went away. It was something that built over time. Now, of course, in my view, that's not unique to them as a generation. I would argue that most of us are in between. Our history has taught us to demand something else. But the point being, this is what we learn from them. So the basis for them to be able to be bridge, bridge builders between people and between you know, the past and where they were at in the future was the fact that they had lived lives of in-betweenness for 15 years, of, you know, which is 80% of their lives at the time. So that's how I arrived at that notion. That's a wonderful metaphor. Now, what interests me is that we as a nation are also in-between. We are in-between where we come from, which we don't talk about, and where we want to go to, but I don't know whether that is shared. And what I believe you are bringing to the fore is the failure of us as families 
to create the spaces for conversations about these issues. Uh, what, what, given your own life story, which I think you should share with people about your own struggles, with your own, si the silences in your own family, and then we'll come back to the silences of the bigger South African family. All right, so of course I'm up for that because I, I'm, I'm up here, so. No, so um, it is, let me, I mean, let's be frank about it, it's tough to open yourself and to share your story openly because you, you, you know. Um, but this is the, <laughs> why I'm sort of, why I would be willing to write this part of the book and to share it openly is because I discovered something else um, through the lives of these young people. Uh, they became my teachers, right? And I became their student was that the critique you would receive, the challenges you would get, the reprisals you experience because you put yourself out there, in actual fact, teach you about change. So I have been privileged to learn that when you try something new courageously and you are pushed back for that, that's a gain not a loss. It's a teaching moment where you become someone that can build bridges. So, I was born in the Free State. A year after, I was a year old, my parents moved to Namibia. They were missionaries. Um, my parents had their own sort of uh, differences of opinion with the politics of the day. The way they responded was to work in the local black communities um, as teachers, essentially. And, um, and so I had, from a young age, uh, lived, well, I grew up in, in, in black communities. And so I had my first sort of white friend when I went to school um, at, at seven years old. Um, I didn't only meet white kids then, it was, I had family that was white, but I mean, I then made a white friend. Um, but from that point onwards, my world had been white. Um, until 1990, when Namibia became independent, and suddenly the world shifted to what should be, in a sense, a normal world. Um, so, um, what I had experienced through my life, though, was to see how my parents, to their credit, and I really, I'm very proud of them, and I respect them greatly, um, that they had um, done their part, if you will, for justice, for the right thing, in the context of the times. So what that had led me to do, it had led me to believe that I'm part of a good family that had done the right thing in the politics of the day. I wasn't actually proud of that, that's not the point. It was just that we weren't as bad as the rest, you know? And so I studied, went to study at Stellenbosch, study a bit of law and then theology. And um, I was then the third generation of, of men in our family to study theology at Stellenbosch. And as I walked down the corridors of the Quirk School, um, there was the picture of my, of my grandfather, Baron Rudolf Bass, and my father, and you know, I'm still Baron Rudolf Bass, by the way, family name. My son as well, but my wife this, you know, is really upset with me, wanting to there. All right, so, um, <laughs> So I was proud, right? Because I, in my mind, there was a second reason, and that is my father had, um, as part of his own studies in theology and missiology, where, um, you know, we basically, you know, had pulled away from the standard theologies of the, of the time, met with Wimbay, Wimbay and, um and he had taken a book along for Wimbay to sign. And so Wimbay signs the book and the right in front of the book um, to, you know, Gerard uh, of my uh, well appreciated former friends, Benny and Jeanette, who's my grandparents. Yes, my dad goes, what? And he asks Wimbay, what's going on? And then Wimbay explains that they were friends at varsity. And when Wimbay then stepped out of the church, he was kicked out, thank you, but of course, agency, right? 
when he decided it's time, right? What did my grandparents do? Rejected him complete and went silent about the relationship. So, so now what happens? My parents, of course, are not silent with me. <laughs> to their credit, again, you could argue they weren't silent enough, or, or they were, they were what? They were too. They were, they weren't in. You know, they should have been a bit more silent. <laughs> How do you say it differently? Or should have been silent about some of the things. Yeah, so I'm not sure, right? But so, um, so of course, I grew up with this consciousness of Bayer's New Deer. And the reason for that was that, and it was, in a sense, an easy definition from my parents was to say, Rudy, you've got to learn to appreciate your heritage with all the chamors. You must look it in the eye and deal with it, you know, because that's who you are. You can't, you know, you've got to live with who you are and what your history is and where you come from. But there's an example, like Bayer's New Deer, that you can live with that. Not reject it, not throw it away. We live with it and still do the right thing. And so I grew up with that. And that, of course, added to my belief that I'm from a good family, man. What's the most right thing, man? So I'm in quick school, doing my, well, I might not have been the best student, but, you know, I, you know, we did, and some with some friends and colleagues that year, we've been working on these type of issues since then, through the student church, reconciliation stuff, peace building around 1994, did all the right thing. But then one day, I had this pictures, family picture of, you know, where I stayed. In my room, I would have pictures up of the family. Proud man, Paismos. One of the pictures of my grandfather, who was, you know, it was a, be a huge beard, you know, or something, fell. The grand, my grandfather now, Mumbai's former friend. And the picture breaks, you know, the frame breaks, and there's a second picture behind the first one in front. You must excuse me if I get emotional. But there's a picture of my grandfather being the, an executive member of the Osava Brandwach at Stellenbosch. Now, you may not know um, or remember, but the Osava Brandwach was a far-right uh, Afrikaner organization started in 1938 during the 100-year celebrations or anniversary, what do you call it, of the Groetrek, which was the beard competition that my grandfather participated in. So the front picture was this beard thing, but the back picture was this also a Brandbach thing. And so suddenly, my proud history of family had been shattered. Because suddenly I had a picture, evidence, that what I had been proud of over time had been a lie. Of course, it wasn't all a lie. But there had been huge silences around who, who I am and who we are, at least as a family. And so, um, yeah, so I had to face that. And of course, I engaged my father and so forth, and it's been a struggle from that day onwards to, to in a sense, work with that uh, fraught history, uh, which implies huge amount of complicity, and at the same time also have huge amount of uh, distances from, from the complicities, you know, and so. So, and, and from that happened, then, then you know, um, it, it was tough enough for me to, in actual fact, wanted to leave theology. And, and, and you know, um, and so what saved me was the prophetic tradition and so forth, where it is about social justice, the ecumenics of the church, um, where it is about, you know, bringing liberation and freedom to people and so forth. But, um, so in the end, it ended up with me also then, um, wanting to take up the role as a predicant in the, in, in, the, in the footsteps of an Umbay and the footsteps of a, a mother and a father who had lived a certain life. Um, <clears throat> so the silence got broken, but it took some time. Yeah. It really took some time. So you were a bridge builder. You are a bridge builder, not only in terms of the work you did at the coffees, but also in your family. But just before we leave Wombe, tell us about Wombe Setuoha. <laughs> All right, this is a, now this will be a silence broken, right? And, and, and um, because this is something very intimate and very close to my heart. 
Um, with all of the struggle around silence in the family and so, Wimbei died in, what was the year? Uh, well, when Wimbei died, I, I um, did not feel free to attend the funeral. Um, and that was before discovering the silences and so forth. And then uh, Tani Ilze, uh, Wimbei's wife, died. This was 2012, I think, yeah? Right, at the start of 2012. Um, and, um, and of course, in this process, and struggling with this history, I attended the memorial or the funeral. And, and, and I had a sense that somehow, to break the silence, I needed to engage the Nodia family. Our family needed to apologize to their family. So I arrived at the funeral, and, but I just knew it was not the time to say anything. And um, it was, it was uh, a gracious sort of event, and it was um, a sad event in many respects, um, but also, of course, a, you know, a thankful and a grateful event. So I had said nothing about my own struggles, which intertwined with the family history, if you will, with Umbay's history at the time. But at the service, um, uh, what's the Dominic's name? Thanks, man. Sorry. Uh, Andre Bartlett, Dr. Andre Bartlett, who actually had been then, at the time, the minister in the congregation called Ask for a Corp, where Mumbai had sort of um, um, stepped out of the church. Um, he was wearing Mumbai's gown, Tuacha. What's the proper English for that? I have no idea. Sorry? T robe. Okay, I'll remember that. So, robe, right? He actually wore... Robe. Okay. All right. So, people, today, people today reminded me, Rudy, you sound Afrikaans, man. So, just <laughs> don't try and speak English. All right. So, I apologize for that. So, so he was wearing Wimbe's robe. And when I saw that... I knew that was the moment of justice, that you take up this mission of this Wimbei. Now, because of a bit of the background, you know, my parents, and therefore we knew much of the deep pain of that family and those people that we are unfamiliar with, the complete rejection of the people they valued as their people. It's a terrible thing. Now, many of us would know that, and I, and I don't presume to know anything what it is like. But so to take up that calling by you know, the robe is a major thing. So what I then did after the service was to actually uh, approach Andre and, and asked him if he would mind if I could borrow the robe um, for my own, um, you know, Ministry. when I, be, you know, when you were, uh, I apologize, oh, Dane, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, man, I don't know what's just happening today. It must be stresses and stuff. But when I had been, so I, so I had later that year, actually a month later, I was ordained as a, as a predicant in Lukov congregation in the Free State, a part-time, part-time, a part-time minister. And I had asked to then, um, to ask if I could borrow the robe, and he was agreed. So I then had been ordained with Uncle Bay's robe, but without telling anyone. <laughs> and, so, and so my purpose was, on the one hand for myself personally, to take up the calling, to work for justice and to work for change and so forth. Uh, but secondly, to do justice, to apologize, to Mbay and his family for what the silence in our family had been. Well, I think that's a real powerful moment and I'm going to give you a break and take you to the bigger family of South Africa. And I'm going to read you an extract of something that is also our family document that we don't seem to be very proud of showing 
to ourselves and the rest of the world. Just give me a moment. Tell my age. <laughs> How many of you have this in your possession? Okay. How many of you read it regularly as a reference point and a reflective uh, document? Okay, now you can see. Here we are, in 1996, we adopted this. After all the hunting arms and the excitement of 1994, we decided that we really want to have a common basis for how this family called South Africa is going to understand who we are and where we're going to. And I'm going to ask for your indulgence to read you the preamble, which is one of the most beautiful texts that we should be able to recite every day, every moment, and have conversations around our dinner tables about, and also have conversations in our schools, our universities, places of worship about. Just let me read it to you. It says, we the people of South Africa, it already, it makes us one family. Recognize the injustices of the past. Honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. Res Respect those who have worked to build and develop our country. And believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. Then, the Obdrach. We therefore through our freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the land, so as to. Now, here come the commitments we make. First commitment, and this is relevant to this book. Heal the divisions of the past. They don't say make peace heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. That's the first obligation we took up. And you need to ask ourselves, what have we done about it? Where's our implementation plan for healing? Second, we said, lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Do we live this? Do we reflect on it? Do we teach our children this? Third, we said we will improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Have we done that? Why? And what are we going to do about it? Finally, we said we will build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. Now it's all very well when you see the rates in coffees. Oh well, those people, you know, how they're so racist, they're so right-wing. What about you and I? Have we passed this test that we set for ourselves? And where are the conversations that are going to 
help us in the healing that's needed. Because one of the central messages of this Bruch Bauer's book is that the first step is just stopping and recognizing the other person and having a conversation. Not stop and figure out what does she look like, what's different, what's... No. Recognize their humanity, which is what we said in this little bookie. It's what we will do. So perhaps you should, uh, at this point, open the discussion for the audience to engage with uh, Rudy, but also to engage on these questions of, it's all very well to judge the Gofis people for their shortcomings. Can we also have comments about our own shortcomings in relation to this little boogie? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Let's give them a round of applause. Before I, I get to you, the audience, um, I'm going to ask Gertrude if you would indulge us for a few minutes just to um, read something that kind of stands out for you um, and maybe make a, a few comments. And I'll stay up here because it's not going to be. I think I'll start first with a comment. Whatever. Whatever works for you. On, yeah. oh, it's, it's not connected. <laughs> because I, I know Rudy, and we as Enochia Kerkis, we have a particular history. And then, of course, the whole issue of reconciliation. And um, I also have an agenda. So on that basis, so for the 30 minutes I had this book in my hand, there were a couple of things that... I need to comment on and just to say it's a very brave book. I think it was also very, it was very educational and shocking, the bits that I've read. I didn't realize the depths of the patriarchy, the power of men, the power of Afrikaner men, the power of young Afrikaner men in this Ontgroening. Uh, in the uh, initiation ceremonies. I read it, I was shocked. I was shocked at the culture of the residences. So for me, it was a, a, a real eye-opener. But, but, but the themes that came out were, the, were the, the power of men, I mean, really, and then all the things that go with it, the culture of the residence, and when more black students came, how there was a contestation of cultures in the residences and the hegemonic culture. So it was, it was really quite shocking, but very important. And I also think Noel, uh, Rudy, Mampela, Henk, I think we need more of these dialogues. And I think that we really can use a book like this as a starting point, or rather continue, okay? Then that's the one thing. I also want to emphasize the issue of this, the, the culture of the seniors versus juniors in the... It, it, was, it was just totally overwhelming. I think that even though that happened in 2007, we still have the incidences of people trying to bury them in the coffin. I think we, we are shocked at the fact that a woman who'd 43 times in a few minutes used the K-word. And the question is, we've had 10 years of the TRC, but the TRC also made recommendations, and I think I want to link up with you with the Constitution, what are we actually doing about it? And that's why I'm really excited for the privilege of being part of this, because I do think these are important dialogues. I also want to comment on the fact that 
the lack of transformation in our universities and the challenges we have that I see there and is now echoed at the university I now am at, UCT. I also see the hegemony of the Afrikaans culture in, at the Kofsis, the interesting things around that. But I also need to use this platform to emphasize that just like land was stolen in this country, so was language stolen, because my ancestors were the first people who spoke Afrikaans. And I think we need to own that. And Diane Ferris makes it quite clear in Afrikaans Metal, and I think we need to start that discourse, that it's actually not your language, it's our language and where it came from. <laughs> I, was, I was surprised to see that and to read that the the bond committee, the committee around the, around the pub in each residence. And this echoed for me. When I went to parliament in, in the first session until 1999, I was shocked that there were six bars at parliament that were open at nine o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure they're still there now, all six of them. <laughs> Anyone can update us that, that this, the bar committee was stronger than the residence committee. And I thought that the, the use of the personal narratives are really quite fascinating of Tabela, Davy, Lorato, and Aletta. And now I'm going to look at you at the book and try. Now, also, I haven't read Afrikaans for very many years. I, I speak Afrikaans and English as most Cape Townians, but it was in the better land for, for the Tate, so my Afrikaans. So uh, thank you. Hi, Hank, for telling me to, to look at page 92. And this is about Lorato. She says here, Jy moet nie toelaat dat jy omstandig hier jou definieer nie, maar skryf jou eie geschiedenis en leef jou eie lewe. I don't think we need to translate, do we? Moe nie die prijs betaal vir wat in die verlede gebeur het nie. Want die mense wat toegelewe het, het reeds daarvoor betaal. Moe nie een lewe van bitterheid leef, wat jy nie eers weet waar dit vandaan kom nie. Dit was haar, dit was Lerato sy argument. And I think that if we are talking about reconciliation, I do think that we need to take issue with this comment. Because... I think that we need to acknowledge the past in some way. How do we do it? It's through dialogue. And I shared earlier with them that I had dialogues when I was at South Clark University. Now, those of you who don't know, it's a new university in the, in the Northern Cape. And uh, I managed to have dialogues with, from the uh, Orania communities to the communities in all, and they actually to dialogue around land. It was uh, not, as, not as successful as I wanted to, but I think the fact that they just were there in one room was also a start. And as Center for African Studies, we're also going to have a dialogue at the end of the year. Uh, Lorato says, Om te bou, was nou deel van Lorato's a toekomstdome, want sy wou mense wees hoe besonders en makkelijk dit is op oor grense te beweeg and diverse friends to make and different experiences to find out. But she was also accused of being a coconut. And it's a very dangerous and sensitive word in our, in our community and in, in our current discourse, and we know all about it. She had no gerupe gevoel om for all swart people to help om hulle nie dier die omstandighede te laat definieer nie, maar ook wit mense vir wie die ewe waar was. Sy was op die punt in haar eie lewe waar sy wou dien, sy wou onderrug verskaf en ander mense help om steeds sterk en onafhankelijk te werk, te word jammer. Nie net vrouwe nie, maar mans ook, denkers en mense wat bereid is om rechter net hulle eie geschiedenis te skep. Lerato het herself ten volle as a brugbouwe geag. And yes, even though I may not agree with everything Lerato says, I think the fact that that story is there is a starting point. And maybe through the dialogues, whatever it is, and I think I'm again looking at your direction and I'm looking at now wherever he is, that 
How do we actually use this? And I think what an interesting chapter I also thought, of course I was intrigued by the fact that this book, the first chapter was called Umbeisa um, Tuacha, and it also ends towards the end of another chapter. Now, I wish I'm going to read it, you know, dying to get to read it. He also talks about Siva Lesser for Verandering. And the first thing that I say is biography as a manier om sin te maak van die levens. How maybe telling our own stories can help us to make sense. The first les, wit en swart was meer eenders as anders. And I think it's only through dialogue we will discover that we actually have more things in common. I think we're so much in a culture of how different we are that we forget our common humanity and what Ubuntu actually means to us. So yes, I, I, I agree with many of these things that you're writing. The third list is oorgangsteie, transition. Oorgangsteie het hulle levens en denke omvergewerp. So the challenges of transition and the change. The third list, hulle moes eers hulle eie onkinde ontdek voor hulle leiding kom neem. First, discover your own ignorance around it. The vierde les, orm arming en afrekening was brood nodig. To embrace it and to maybe deal and confront issues are really important. The vijfde les, a chaotische en verwarrende proces. Ja, I'm daar gaan where we're confused, where we're overwhelmed, emotionally, it'll be so much and it'll take a lot out of us. But maybe, you know, that healing and true healing has to have pain. And I know that in your writing and also when you were sharing, it was a very, it was a very emotional time and I think um, it's not my platform now, so, but I could identify with some of the pains you were talking about. Decestiness. A onderliggende nieuwe kennis oor wit en swart. And yeah, I also want to just uh, comment, I've had the privilege now to be working with the Khoisan community, and um, which has been left out of the constitution. And so maybe we must also see, we must also disaggregate. Because as much as we can talk about wit en swart, there is ook man en vrou. And patriarchy is deep, deep, and on silla and on blood. And we may, for six days of the week, talk about transformation and democracy and equality. And then some of us will go to a place of religion on a Friday or a Saturday night, a sub Shabbat or a Sunday. And all those things that were unfair. The entire the entire equality we think we are talking about and we want to practice is then reinforced. In the fact, I always say, you know, that uh, you may know as a theolog, that uh, the story of Gideon is used very often, the young Gideon, and that's Judges 6. And uh, I've had opportunity, because I was also an associate with, um, um, what is it called now, the organization I was part of at Stellenbosch? N not uh, for political, yeah, I was part of for Dias Nordir Center for, uh, for public, uh, um, public Theology. And I, and I so often speak to ministers and I say, you know, it's interesting that we always hear about uh, Richter 6, Judges 6, and we never ever look at Judges 4 and Judges 5. Judges 4 and Judges 5, it's about, for those of you who know, about Deborah, the, the prophetess, who led the army, and the man who wouldn't go to the army unless she actually was there. And then also um, Yael, who killed the leader of the Philistines, or Lovinus. I think I must stop now, should I? Uh, um, Your last lesson. My last one. That the dialogue should continue. That I think we need maybe a continuous process of theology. I was really privileged to work in Rwanda for six years. For three months of the year, there's memorial time. What do they do? From the 7th to the 14th of April is Memorial Week. 
everything is closed. There are only ceremonies where they talk, where they testify. And for the entire three months, from the 7th of April to the 4th of July, when the Liberation Army came in, they do reconciliation work. They talk about, they tell their stories. And we all do work. For example, I was part of building a house for a widow. The prisoners, the genocidiers, come out weekends to build houses for the children of the victims they've killed. So it's a really a challenge for us in some way to learn from a country like Rwanda where transformation and reconciliation is not just a slogan or a rhetoric, but rather something practical and they live it. But I can, I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gertrude. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open the floor now for comments, questions. Uh, can I? Can I please ask for help? <laughs> um, can I please ask that um, you know to to give as many people as possible an opportunity to to ask a question or make a comment that you try and be as brief as possible. The book has been written. It, it, you know, and we know that now because some of us have a copy. So please don't rewrite the book. Um, <laughs> let's have your question or your comment, and um, we'll take four, four at, the, at a time. Yes, uh, I, see, I recognize you. It's second hand here. Okay, let's go with the two of you. There's three one and the fourth one in, in the middle. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bass. I am fascinated about the doctors the Dutch Reformed Church created. I know that the free state where you grew up was actually just a gateway for people from Turkey to enter South Africa. And the fact that you are a product of the father, one of the fathers of the white Christmas. Uh, maybe um, the WC could also be the toilet. Um, so my question, I'm a bit disappointed that Gertrude didn't ask something in this line, but my question is with regards to the LGBTI community within the Dutch Reformed Church. I've zoomed in a couple of years ago when I uh, tried to solve some murder cases within the Dutch Reformed Church um, with regards to property theft, where people in those kind of relationships would end up six feet under. I never read your book, but uh, do you touch on this subject within your book? And also, um, you, uh, Gertrude spoke about Wimbase Tuacha. I was just wondering, are we talking of the Toga Sun? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good evening. Mine is more of post the idea of unveiling the silence. Where do we return to the moral obligation? And yourself as a theologian and I think a year ago we had um, Dr. Alan Busak visiting us. And with black consciousness, we talk of the black Messiah. And that was the great question, even with Cornerstone as the institute here, that where is black theology? Where is the moral obligation that in essence, those who give the hand of reconciliation are seeking and have been seeking as a way that 
Our salvation is the same if we speak on the Christianity paradigm. Our God is the same. Where is your moral obligation? Because we can unveil history, but what do we do with history? When we are angry, and we can tell people it's fine to be angry, but what do we do? And then where is moral obligation when we have people who have a constitution they don't use? People who remain avatars, people who troll other people when things about this country have to be discussed. People who kill people who are breaking silences. Are we really honestly ready? Because that level of moral obligation and equality is something that we must commit to before we think we're going to see results. And hence, it's a common. And hence, the friction of change is insoluble. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very struck by the fact that you're working with men, mostly. And Gertrude's comment about men and the power of men is, I think, extraordinarily important. I thought I was a reasonable man until about three years ago. And I realized just how unreasonable I was. And so my question is, is there not, in a sense, far more, far more in-depth work to be done around bringing up boys the correct way than even to address the racial issue? Okay, we'll take the fourth one and then we'll ask you to comment. Would you like to end that? Hi, Didi. So I'm a theological graduate, um, theology. So I'm going to try and be brief, Stan, because I've just got all these notes that I've written down. But it's really, I mean, tangibly one could feel your pain um, and your woundedness from the white side. And so I was here previously when Alan Busak was there. So it was somewhat refreshing to see the pain from, from the white side of the fence. Um, but people, people are, are wounded, um, both white and black, and we are in pain. And there is definitely, I think it's critical that more of these conversations happen. And so when Gertrude spoke about the TRC, I was like, whatever. It, 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 it was really just um, a drop in the ocean. So currently today, waking up, today feels like 1994. 1994 to me was a false equilibrium. And there's something that you said about, about change. Change doesn't often bring peace. And so I'm asking, is the change, is this violence that we are experiencing now, um, it feels like war. Is it really, is, 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 this, is this change, the reconciliation, is this what is bringing all this chamors, issues of restitution? issues of inequality and justice. So for us, that was supposed to happen at 1994. So now the land issue came and it's a huge debacle. My question is, is the church deliberately silent on these social economic issues? We speak about black, and, and I'm gonna quickly speak about the black consciousness that, that Dr. Dempele speaks about. Um, the huge reconciliation in the Western Cape still around colored and black people. How I see myself as black, but my sister sees herself as colored. So what is the church doing around reconciling our identity as, as, as black people? The other thing was around women, the deliberate, I think, the, the equalizing or restoring the, the original idea of male and female. Um, and, and the church's silence on, on some of those things. Okay, thank you, Rudy. Good luck. Well, thank you for all, for all the inputs. I really, really, really do appreciate it and that you think along. And thank you for your comments, uh, Gertrude and, and um, 
um, um, you know, doctor and doctor. Respect, respect, <laughs> respect, you know. Yeah. yeah, right. Professors, you know, teachers, teachers. Um, but just on... Um, Be honest and tell them that you call me Ma. <laughs> Thank you, Ma. <laughs> so, um, yes, I have many mothers and I have many fathers, but... So, the LGBTI community, I don't specifically address it in the... I don't tell, tell those stories in the book. But when you read the stories, you will see it's always present because it is about the power of men. I'm going to give you an example. And if you allow me to share a little bit, you know. So when I, so at school, I was elected or selected as head boy. And we were initiated as the leadership core of the school by the following. You, you know these big... Uh, industrial bins, rubbish bins, the big ones the thing picks up and you know. So, so those things were taken and then it was half filled with water and oil and gemors. It was, uh, what's Buxton and no man? Uh, bricks. Sorry. Bricks put inside and then you were put in, you know, naked, closed and it was rolled. Right? And when it stops, and you get out, and you laugh with the group, you're a hero of the school. But if you shout in between, stop, stop, or you start crying and you get out, you're still a member of the SRC, but you don't have respect. Now, that is a, now at the time, that was just life. Still in my memory bank, it's just life. I don't define it as a deep trauma that in actual fact represents. So why I tell the story is because the body is always there. And the notions of what men is and what men should be and how you become male and masculine is, is part of it. So no, this storyline around the rights deals with all these issues. But the, but the, the cornerstone of the story <laughs> is race. And how that plays out, and that's a, how it's a rallying point for all these issues. So you see it there, but the stories are about our biographies of race. Um, so yes and no. Um, the idea is not to tell everything, uh, not to touch on everything, not to speak to everything, but to get the conversation going for us to tell our stories, to have the courage to do that. So the second one, just on... Um, uh, where will we now? Oh, right. So the moral obligation, right? The question around, you know, where the churches at least would be in terms of, in terms of the question, what are the church in actual fact doing? Sort of the so-called commitment to social justice. You know, the word in the world today, if you will. Um, now, I, you, know, it's, you know, I would not speak on behalf of the church, but I must say that during the apartheid years, in my reading of it, it was easier to stand on the side of justice or not. It was easier to define the, the enemy and the policy and the incidents and so forth. It was in a sense easier. Now we all know that, it's not news. So what I think we are missing as in, in the church at least what I'm missing in the church, is the bravery to acknowledge that and to struggle through it, to define the moments of injustice and to hold that and be honest about that struggle. So the case of, of, of the Dutch Reformed Church today um, um, around sort of gay identity and gay relationships and love and so, in actual fact, it's about that struggle and, and defining where the injustice is. Now the struggle is that, you know, an organization, an institute, a structure, would respond to what its members, in a sense, or what it thinks its members believes. And so to my mind, the push in actual fact, the question of moral obligation is not for the church as a structure. It's for us as members. What are we pushing for? 
And that's not actually true for the church only. It's, in a sense, the citizen's argument is that, in reality, we've left it to the organizations and, and our representatives. So I know I'm not answering, but I'm, in a sense, attempting to reflect what my thinking and my question, my own struggles at the moment. Um, so um, this is one more, one, one, this is one other thing I wanted to say, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick, Stan, just something in the lives of these students that I think is important for us to, to take note of, whether you read the book or not, remember this one. They had two experiences as they struggled with race. The one was that they were embraced for being in between. So when they, when they coconuts, or when they, uh, uh, I apologize for the word, kaffir booties, all right? When they, when they called that, they are at the same time rejected by their home communities, but they pushed into a new community, a community of in-betweeners. We don't see that. They didn't see it. But when the Times asked for bridge builders, they had lived lives of in-betweeners because they were punished for being in-between and they were, so they were sometimes embraced for doing new things as in-betweeners. So what you find is, is both the embrace and both the reprisal taught them to build bridges. Not only the embrace and not only the reprisal. And so in the book I make the argument that the embrace, the omarming, and the afrikening, the reprisal, in actual fact, are protesting colleagues and collaborators in creating bridge builders. What we don't do well is to, <laughs> to recognize in ourselves our in-betweenness and pull on the embrace and pull on the reprisal and then lead for change. So sorry for going on. And just the one last thing on the, on the power of men um, and sort of gender and, and boys and so forth. I'm absolutely privileged to be the parent of a young boy. His name's Brent. Um, and what I'm really lucky with is got a brilliant, you know, an angel mother who's not here. <laughs> and why I say that is that I've realized that for me to be a good father, I need to be a mother taught by his mother. So I, I can only agree with you, but I think the work is for, you know, for men such as myself, for fathers, to learn to be taught by mothers. Not their mothers, their wives, their sisters, their daughters, their, you know, who are all mothers teaching men. <laughs> um, but I really believe that, you know. So, a, so, a, so a, a young, I really believe a, a young um, a girl, a daughter, will teach a father about what it means to be to live life meaningfully, but we can't hear that um, because fathers don't hear children uh, and men don't hear women and so forth. Um, so uh, I know I'm not answering, but in a sense, I, I agree with you. But here's the moment of hope. <laughs> young people know it. You know, you, you know, young people know it because these messages are out there and they live it. It's their friends who commit suicide. It's sad news. Uh, a boy of 13 years old today committed suicide in the, in the primary school where my son is, is a learner. 13 years old. So it's not new things to young people. I struggle with it at 40 years old as a father. Um, because of me becoming a man in apartheid South Africa. But it's a different life for young people. Maybe we should just learn from them rather than try to teach them. Sorry, I'm going on. Um, and then this is the last, and this is my last comment. Sorry, Stan. You, don't, you know, there's, 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 I wanted to say there's three things, Nina. This is the last thing I really want to say, and is 
You know, to build bridges is about who you are, and that is in between us. It is about how you know, not what you know, how you know. And that is about transitions, a transitional society. And then it is about what you do and how you do, which is about standing in between and building the bridges. And people do it. We all have those moments. We need to galvanize them. Sorry for going on. Have you been covered? No. <laughs> no, she will speak for herself. Have you been covered? OK, thank you. Um, I'm watching the time. And, and let me put it this way. If you are going to complete, be completely unfulfilled if you don't make your point now, there's always one or two people who need to speak. And if you're one of those people that if you don't ask your question or make your point, I will give occasion for two people to give to make some input. Ask a question or make a brief comment. Sure. Um, so, so what is peace? I, I was struck with the opportunity of interfaith conversation. <clears throat> Much of my saving grace had been that I had um, transitioned between at least Christian denominations. So in my own life, I moved between the Dutch Reformed Church and the Anglican Church and township churches and so forth. So, and so, so membership had, 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 in a sense, been less important than the moments of encounter um, and so some of the interactions between St. George's and the Muslim community and so forth have been, have been part of. But in reality, I left the church. I stuck with God, at least how God expressed in relationship with me. So the relationship, of course, at least, you know, as we would know, at least in Christianity, is with Christ, not with the church. And so the, the justice that, that we seek um, comes from the cross, not from the church. And so the challenge to the church is, where's the justice if you hold the cross to be your center? Anyways, I mean, this is not my ideas, this is, this is life, but this, those had sustained me in difficult times. Um, I remain a Dutch Reformed church predicant because that means something when you've been privileged to have moments of liberation from the you know shackles of the past, so it means something. So I'm 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 less convinced that you must leave. That I'm convinced that as a member or as a participant, you must drive what you want to see change. I'm not pleading, stay behind the desk and you know coordinate the process for change. I'm saying speak up and challenge. So uh, whether you're in or out, but you know, take it there. In terms of what is peace, um, uh, my point in the book is that peace is a myth. So what we, when we use this, the, when, we sh when, we, when we call it the struggle for peace, we, we use that language in the context of a real threat of war and not a psychological war, yes, of course, that as well, but people wanting to kill each other and having killed each other and having lived those lives, but that has transitioned into us, in my view, misunderstanding that to be peaceful and to engage in a way that shows dignity, you know, respect and honors dignity of peoples and people's lives, that that, that, is, that they would have peace. In my view, it's not the case. So in my view, what we struggle with at the moment in the country, around the land issue for instance, it's not new. We've not had peace. We've just called it peace. But it was not peace. And so now we're surprised? No, of course, none of us are surprised in reality. We've not had. So I, I apologize if I disrupt anyone's notions of where we're going with peace. But I do think the way we talk about it creates the myth of what we can achieve. So, you know, I, yes, I don't want peace. I want a dignified, peaceful engagement that challenges what we've got to change, but, but not the peace that we normally talk about. 
Um, and then just the last one on, um, <clears throat> on confession. I really appreciate your comments, and I get the struggle of looking for voices that can at least somehow show you somewhat of um, how to do things different and how to live an authentic life for where we're at today. But if I, I, I really want to, uh, I'm, I'm really sort of angry at myself. For many years, looking at the leaders of institutions and wanting to be one myself and then becoming one. Um, and so then in actual fact, not driving the change myself. So the point I want to make is, I know it'll be, it's, it's, it's a warm embrace when there's people that had lived the life and that you can draw examples from. It's, it's really encouraging and embracing when leaders in organizations, whether church, politics, business, wherever else, do the right thing. It's, it's encouraging. Great. But the problem with that is, I step away from my agency and my capacity at reimagining what my life will be for good principle, for the you know, ethics of a constitution, to reimagine what our communities and our society can be, and then driving that. So I rather critique the leaders from the side. And, and the point is, you know, if I drive something with, with fellow citizens, political parties, for Dinky, how is that in English now? Change their song, is that? Tune. Change their uh, tune, yeah, sure, sorry. Change their tune. When church members are prepared to go to court, then a church changes its song, uh, its tune, you know? So it is really about what you want to do. And I'm not planning individualism. I'm just saying, you can't be a citizen of our democracy and think you can't do anything. Now, of course, we don't have to be superhuman. That's not the point. I'm just saying where I'm at, I do what I can with what I have to change and reimagine a society. So stop worrying about the organizations. What do you do? So the confession that is good enough is when you walk across the street and you do a confession with your friend from across the road right there and then. No one has to know about that. And that's the tough part. No one will know about it, mostly. And it's a tough thing if you want to build bridges because no one knows, you know? No one will hear your confession, but the people you confess to. And that's why, and, and that's why and I, and I, I, I feel in a sense, um, it's tough for me to share from my life, right? But the point for me was, the apology was of my grandfather to Umbai and my family to the Nudia family, because it's our immediate environment. It's a real, it's intimate. So when the time comes, as I have had to do, I would apologize as a white male on behalf of white people, white men. And the time comes and you must do that. But you can't wait for that. The confessions are in the intimate moments immediate. I know you know that. I'm just, I'm just you know, reminding you of it. So, thank you. Friends, I, I hope that you have been stimulated to read the book. Um, and, and um, you know, I, as I was reading the book, I thought, you know, once a theologian, you remain a theologian. And I saw the theology coming through, you know. Um, you know, he, he refers to his four characters, um, and, and each one of them is worsteling with something. You know, they're struggling or what's... Yeah, it, and, and, and that's so theological, you know. Um, but, but what is fascinating that it is, is that it talks about, you know, the one, of, the one worsteling with quadvius, um, bangvius, scamvius, and fravius. And, and so in typical sermonic fashion, there's a progression there, you know, from quadvius to fravius. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's the, the, the seven, uh, uh, the seven lesser, but yeah, it's a little 
and then that, as, as Gertrude shared with us, the seven insights. Um, and I, I found that quite interesting because I, 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 I think that um, it's a wonderful way to frame something. Um, and and, and I, I, I just like the, how you humanize these young people. Their stories are not perfect. They're not perfect. Um, but, but you've captured it beautifully when you said that that in-betweenness is about both the embrace and the rejection. And I think that's where the bravery lies. And the one thing that I learned from these students and from you, because it's brave to sit here, it's brave to write this book and to expose yourself. Because for all of us, you know, I read this book, you know, you can, you can critique this book as much as you want to because you have the luxury of sitting in your armchair. But what these students and, and, and you show us is that they found themselves in, an, in a new paradigm. There were no rules for this new paradigm. And that's, our, that's our struggle in this country. There are no rules for this new paradigm. And, and they were prepared to, to embrace it and in that sense become pioneers of this new paradigm. Um, and so I want to thank you also for being a pioneer of this paradigm, for worsting with the issues. And so ladies and gentlemen, let's give another round of applause for our author, <laughs> Rudy Bass, and our two professorial respondents, Professor Ampella and Gertrude Fester. Thank you very much to Cornerstone for hosting us and for putting all of this together, and thank you for coming. Thank you, and to our facilitators, Stan Inkerman. The, the genius of the, of the panel is just, you know, it's just mind-blowing, isn't it? And I'm very privileged, Dr. Rudy Bates, to be working with you every day of my life. And I look forward to coming to work tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> And then Gertrude, what can one say? You know, you rise to the occasion over and over again. I worked with Gertrude for three years at Hewitt College, and for two years she was in jail during that period. But we were together, and we didn't not think about her for one single day over that two years that she knows that. So, and then doctor, mama, friend, sister, inspirer, the sheer genius that you bring the quality of the questions, what you've done here this evening, what you've opened up, I stand in respect for the work that you do. Thank you so much. People, <laughs> buy the book, buy the book. Um, Rudy will sign the book.